Well, hello everyone. This is Gülis Barkan, uh, the president of the American Society of Cytopathology. Welcome to one of our uh, Wednesday uh, webinar sessions. Uh, today's session uh, will be given uh, by our very um, own Dr. Mohidin or Mohi Gofrani. Uh, we're very lucky to have him speak, and today's talk will be about uh, the smartphone applications, which is a very uh, important topic these days. We do everything from our phones. Uh, we pay bills, um, we attend meetings, um, all sorts of things. And today will be a great day to learn about what can we do in terms of using uh, the smartphones uh, in the world of cytopathology. So um, let me introduce Dr. Gofrani to you. Dr. Gofrani is the System Medical Director for Laboratory Services and the Director of Cytopathology and Women's Health at Peace Health Southwest Medical Center in Vancouver, Washington. He earned his medical degree in Tehran, followed by a residency in anatomic and clinical pathology and fellowship at Yale University. Dr. Gofrani has subspeciality in training in breast and gynecologic pathology, uh, in addition to cytopathology. He holds an MBA with a focus on healthcare from George Washington University and is board certified in clinical informatics. He does have a lot of accolades, as you see. He has served as the president of the Washington State Society of Pathologists, the president of the Oregon Pathologist Associations, uh, the vice chair of the College of American Pathologists Cytopathology Committee. And for us in the ASC world, he has been the chair of the Budget and Finance Committee, one of the very important committees, and he currently chairs the App Development Subcommittee for the ASC Product Innovation Committee, so important committee there too. He is a trustee of the American Board of Pathology, and he chairs the Anatomic Pathology Test Development and Advisory Committee. A lot on his plate, and yet he's young and dynamic, and I can't wait to learn about these uh, uh, smartphone applications. Take it away, Dr. Gofrani. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Barkhan, for that kind introduction, and thank you for calling me young. Uh, allow me to uh, share my screen uh, for a moment. And get the presentation started. So, uh, as Dr. Barkhan mentioned, uh, we're going to be talking today about uh, smartphone applications in cytopathology. Um, I'm going to be talking about many different commercial hardware and software products, uh, but I have no financial relationship with any of them that could con constitute a conflict of interest. Uh, here are the objectives for our talk today. Uh, first, we're going to provide a brief update on the use of inherent smartphone capabilities in cytopathology. Second, we'll talk about uh, reviewing a few cytology-specific smartphone apps, and then uh, we'll discuss some potential regulatory considerations as it pertains to FDA oversight of smartphone applications uh, in cytopathology. Now, as you all know, we've come a long way from the 1960s when being able to carry a phone in our pocket was a futuristic concept. Uh, these days, smartphones not only fit in our pocket, but function as so much more than a simple telephone. Uh, there are a wide variety of factors that come into play when deciding on purchasing a cell phone. Uh, obviously, there's the cost consideration, but also brand recognition and word of mouth are important factors that influence our choice. If we want to get into more technical details, uh, factors such as hardware features, um, type of operating system and user interface, the software apps that are included and available with the phone, and the network technology. For example, does it support 5G or not? They may be important to us. And finally, there are some factors that take the decision out of our hands. Uh, for example, my workplace may limit the range of possible options for purchasing a cell phone for the department based on the phone security features and the wireless carrier's coverage area or special arrangements that already exist between my workplace and those companies. Currently, there are two smartphone operating systems that dominate the smartphone market. Uh, one is iOS, 
by Apple that is the operating system that runs iPhones. iPhones are known to have a more uniform, accessible user experience, and they're considered to be more private and secure, which is in part due to Apple's strict oversight of their App Store. As uh, you probably heard uh, CEO Tim Cook's court testimony a couple of weeks ago. This tighter oversight has naturally led to higher quality of apps designed for iPhones. Also, since Apple not only makes phones, but also desktop computers, laptops, tablets, even watches, there is a sense of continuity of experience if you have multiple Apple hardware devices in your home. So for example, you can start working on a document on your phone and then switch to your iPad and pick up where you left off, or you can use your Apple Watch for security access to your MacBook. And finally, uh, third-party manufacturers seem to have built more accessories for iPhones compared to other smartphone brands. The other major smartphone operating system is Android, which is te technically open source, but is in, in effect, it's sponsored by Google. Uh, the advantages of Android devices include a wider choice of devices for different budget levels. Uh, there are more customization options. And um, Google's suite of apps and services is already built in to Android phones. Now, regardless of whether you have an iPhone or an Android phone, it's the apps that are installed on your smartphone that determine how you use it in your day-to-day -day life. So an app is essentially a computer program, according to its original definition, that runs on a mobile device, like a smartphone or a tablet. And in fact, years ago, it was suggested that smartphones be called app phones to distinguish them from the less sophisticated earlier mobile phones. However, more recently, things have gotten a little confusing because the term apps is also applied to desktop application software. So, um, Interestingly, while I was preparing this presentation, I came upon this uh, piece of trivia that the word app was chosen as the American Dialect Society's 2010 Word of the Year. And just to show you how much uh, this reflects the importance of apps in our modern society, here are some other words of the year. In 2012, it was hashtag. In 2014, it was hashtag Black Lives Matter. In 2015, it was the singular they. In 2016, it was dumpster fire. In 2017, it was fake news. And in 2020, it was, not surprisingly, COVID. So as I mentioned, the word app is increasingly being used for desktop applications as well. But for the purposes of this talk, when I talk about apps, I mean smartphone apps. So just as we have desktop web browsers, we also have web browsers on our smartphones. The difference being that the display of the text and graphics is optimized for the smartphone's smaller screen. And then there are native apps that are specifically designed for the particular smartphone platform uh, to make optimal use of that specific phone's hardware and software features. So in addition to the apps that commonly come pre-installed on most smartphones, there are many generic apps that, although they haven't been designed specifically for cytology, they can be used in that context. So one such example are social media apps that can be used not only for cytopathology education, but also for networking and for better understanding what's going on in our professional community. And here I'd like to take the opportunity to put in a plug for the ASC and ask if you haven't already to follow the ASC on your preferred social media platforms, be it Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or LinkedIn. Another fun way to not only learn some cytopathology, but also on a more personal level, get to know the leaders in our field, is to subscribe to Pathology and Cytopathology podcasts. And here I want to give a shout out to Dr. Barkon, who under her leadership, the ASC has started its own podcast called Cytopath Pod. And I highly recommend subscribing to this and the many other wonderful podcasts that are out there. They're both very informative and very fun to listen to. Another generic app that is available for virtually every smartphone is YouTube, which if you are watching this webinar, you are probably already familiar with. Once again, the ASC has a channel here. It's called Cytopath1951 and it has hours of useful content. These video clips are, could be as short as a couple of minutes 
to close to an hour and a half long, so you can easily fit watching or listening to them in your daily routine. Uh, and here are, you can see on the screen some of the topics and video clips that have been put on the ASC channel. Now, one of the most popular features of today's smartphones is the built-in camera. And sometimes people even choose their smartphone based on the quality of the camera hardware and its software features. So just as we can hold up our smartphone camera to capture that perfect scene, we can use it to capture a certain microscopic field of view by holding it up to one of the microscope's ocular lenses. Now, being able to hold the smartphone at the right position and hold it steady long enough to take the photo take some practice and eventually take a few snapshots that with some cropping and adjustments can be used for on-the-fly sharing. Uh, but if you want to use your smartphone as an alternative to an actual camera mounted on the microscope, it's best to use a smartphone microscope, microscope adapter, preferably on the second head of a microscope. Uh, these adapters may be uh, adjustable models like this one here that attaches to one of the microscope ocular lenses. And you can see with moving those brackets up and down, you can place the phone on the tray and adjust to the size of that phone so that the phone is firmly in place. And once you find that sweet spot where the phone needs to be positioned so that it can um, get the ocular lens, right in front of the camera lens, uh, then you can start taking pictures, photomicrographs. Now, this is a uh, type of adapter that can be used for almost any smartphone. There are some adapters that are designed for specific smartphone brand and model, which in that case, it will limit its utility to only that specific phone. But either way, once you find an adapter that can accommodate your smartphone, it becomes uh, much easier to take better quality photomicrographs using your phone. There are also some adapters that can not only be adjusted to your particular smartphone, but also they attach to both oculars. So they provide a more stable mount on the microscope. Now, all of these adapters can be used not only for taking snapshots, but also for capturing video, microscopy clips, which would be virtually impossible using the manual method of holding your phone up to the microscope. You can move around the slide, change magnifications, zoom up and down. You can imagine with some editing how useful such video clips can be in preparing educational slide seminars that can be uploaded to the cloud and made available to a worldwide audience. Now, up until a few years ago, there were only a handful of manufacturers that made smartphone microscope adapters. But now, if you search online, there are so many there uh, that it's impossible to present a comprehensive review. So if you're interested, I would just recommend reading the reviews of these products and choosing one that you think would best meet your needs. So in addition to the use of smartphone photomicrography in creating cytopathology educational materials, uh, it can be also used to improve our cytology reports by documenting uh, select fields of view in the body of our report. So including photomicrographs in uh, pathology reports not only enhances their aesthetic appeal, but can also provide convincing visual evidence to support the text of our diagnosis. So in case our report goes to another healthcare professional, they can see some snapshots of what we saw that led to a particular diagnosis. And I think this has become even more important uh, since certain provisions of the 21st Century Cures Act were put into place just a couple of months ago that require us to give patients access to their pathology reports without delay. And so you can imagine patients getting their pathology report and taking it to their trusted healthcare professional with lots of questions. And having those images in the body of the report can make it easier for those providers to explain the text. Finally, uh, smartphone photomicrography can be used to facilitate teleconsultations. Now, as you all know, telecytology is a form of telepathology 
where we can transmit live or static images most commonly to consult with colleagues in a different location or perform remote rapid on-site evaluations or rows. Now, this is a table that I've adapted from Dr. Lin's paper in JASC a couple of years ago with some minor edits of my own. Uh, so it's not exactly the table that was in that paper. And it's on the different modalities of telecytology. And for the purposes of this talk about smartphone applications, I'm only going to focus on the first two modalities. One is static image transmission, which its advantages include that it is simple to do, is not very expensive, and doesn't need both the transmitting and the receiving end of the communication to be on at the same time. But on the flip side, it is time consuming to select and capture good diagnostic fields of view. We can have the whole slide captured in case the consultant wants to look at other areas of the slides. And, and this is a feature of three-dimensional cytology slides. In some cases, we can get all cells in the field of view to all be in focus at the same time. The second method of telecytology is live image transmission, essentially video conferencing which is also simple and has the added advantage of being able to review the entire slide if necessary. But this is a synchronous method. In other words, both the transmitting and receiving end of the communication need to be on the call at the same time. And they both need to be on the same video conferencing software. So up to this point, uh, we have been talking about generic smartphone applications that can be adapted for cytopathology practice. Now let's talk about some apps that have been developed specifically for cytopathology. These would be considered a subset of medical smartphone apps. And as healthcare professionals, we would use them most commonly to gain easy access to useful information. According to industry estimates, there are about 325,000 healthcare apps available for smartphones in 2017, with about 3.7 billion downloads that year. The FDA considers um, mobile medical apps to be medical devices if they are used on a mobile device, meet the definition of a medical device, and are either an accessory to a regulated medical device or transform a smartphone into a regulated medical device. So once a mobile app falls into the category of a medical device, it could be subject to FDA oversight. Now, the FDA outlined its policy for oversight of medical apps first in 2013, which was then updated in 2015, and more recently in 2019. In this document titled Policy for Device Software Functions and Mobile Medical Applications, the FDA divides medical apps into three categories. Those that do not meet the definition of medical device, those that do meet the definition of medical device, but the FDA will exercise enforcement discretion, which is another way of saying they will not enforce oversight up front. And finally, those that do meet the definition of medical device and the FDA will enforce oversight on them. Uh, the first category of medical apps that are not considered medical devices include generic apps like the ones we've been discussing. Image display apps for tumor boards or consultation, medical reference apps, and other educational tools. So one such app that comes to the top of the list when you search for cytology in the App Store is Cyto Atlas. And as the name implies, this is a cytology atlas in app form, which has different organ-specific chapters. And for example, when you select the salivary gland chapter, you're presented with a few common entities, and then you can select the entity you want to learn about and you can see a good number of microscopic images as well, a few, as well as a few bullet points about that entity. Another cytology app is SlideWise, which is sort of like a flashcard game where you are presented with a number of GYN cytology images. And if you think it's H-cell, you swipe right. And if it's not H-cell, then you swipe left. So for example, I swipe this case of herpes as not H-cell, but this case of candida, I purposefully swiped it as H-cell, and this is the feedback that I got. So when you're playing this game, the app will give you feedback as to whether you are correct or not, but will not tell you much in terms of why your answer is correct or incorrect. 
Finally, another Cytology educational app is MD Hero, which frankly I found it difficult to navigate when I was reviewing it for the purposes of this talk. So for example, um, I searched for thyroid and I had to type it in, T-H-Y. Uh, I selected papillary carcinoma and I found a few Cytology images as well as some text information. But as I said, I think this app has room for improvement both in terms of content and user interface. Now, the next category of apps are those that the FDA has chosen to exercise enforcement discretion because they're considered to pose minimal risk to patients and consumers. So one example that is pertinent to our discussion is any clinical decision support app that uses uh, patient characteristics such as age, sex, and relevant risk factors to provide patient-specific screening, counseling, and preventive recommendations from well-known and established authorities. So the ASCCP app may be considered to fall into this category of enforcement discretion. As you probably all know, the American Society for Colposcopy and Cervical Pathology issued its most recent consensus guidelines for managing abnormal cervical cancer screening tests a couple of years ago. And the paradigm shift in these new guidelines was risk-based management. In other words, using data from a huge prospective cohort of more than 1.5 million patients that were followed for more than a decade at Kaiser Permanente Northern California, the five-year risk for CIN3 or worse was calculated for different combinations of GY and cytology and cervical biopsy results. And the appropriate management was determined not based on the specific test results, but on the calculated risk. So if, for example, the risk in a particular patient is calculated to be less than 4%, then the patient is recommended to undergo surveillance. But if it is more than 4%, then the recommendation is colposcopy or surgical treatment. However, since both the data base that served as the basis for these calculations and the number of possible test combinations is so large, it's virtually impossible to memorize the risks associated with all the possible mutations. So to illustrate this, if you read the paper about the risk estimates supporting the management guidelines, there are 10 different tables with over 100 possible test combinations and their associated risk. And these are just the most common permutations the um, rest of the possibilities are listed in the appendices and the additional materials that are available. Fortunately, there's an app for that. Um, so for example, let's say that you have a 34-year-old with a history of an H-cell PAP who underwent colposcopy and was found to only have CIN1. So what would be the appropriate management if her post-colposcopy surveillance co-testing showed HPV negative L cell? So you see there are multiple factors here that we need to take into consideration. One way that you could find out what this patient's risk is, is to search through the tables in that supplemental paper that I talked about in the previous slide and find this particular combination of test results in table 4B and see that her risk is 1.3%. Therefore, the appropriate management would be one year follow-up. But in the ASCCP app, you can select the same patient scenario. You can say that you're looking for management of results during post-colposcopy surveillance. You enter the patient's current testing that shows it's HPV negative l -cell. You indicate that her previous colposcopy was CIN1 preceded by H cell. You make sure you've entered the test results correctly in a summary screen. And then you arrive at this screen finally where it shows the same recommendation we saw in table 4B that the appropriate management is one year follow up because the five year risk of CIN3 or worse is 1.3%. Finally, the third category of medical apps are those that are considered medical devices and pose enough of a potential risk that, that they will be the focus of FDA regulation. And one example that is mentioned in the FDA document is an app that analyzes an image of a skin lesion using mathematical algorithms and provides the user with an assessment of the risk of the lesion. 
Applying this example to cytopathology, you can imagine any AI-based apps that are developed in the future that use cytomorphologic features to suggest a diagnosis could be the subject of this kind of oversight. And I think that's a good thing. So to summarize, uh, we've seen that uh, there are many generic smartphone apps that can be used in cytopathology to promote education and professional networking. There are several smartphone microscope adapters on the mic market that provide a low cost option for photomicrography and teleconsultation in cytology. And finally, most current cytopathology apps do not meet the definition of medical device or they only pose minimal risk to consumers. But we should keep in mind that more sophisticated cytology apps may be subject to FDA regulation in the future. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention and would be happy to take any questions uh, either on the live chat or you can send me by email. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Gofrani. That was a very nice overview of uh, what is going on in the uh, world of the smartphone uh, applications. So I actually have a couple of questions. And uh, what I was thinking also to remind our um, uh, listeners uh, to type in, since they're listening to this now, they're, they're listening on our YouTube channel. Uh, if it's on the day uh, that it's aired, uh, which would be June 9th, uh, they can actually type in the question there, uh, and we will be able to give an answer live. Um, if not, uh, if they can still type it there, um, or if they can reach out to you at your email, uh, that would be another possibility to get the answers. So just a couple of questions here and there. Um, so come July, our new group of fellows will be starting. Uh, if a new fellow or a new resident who's interested in cytology asks you which of the uh, smartphone applications do you recommend, um, what is your answer? So um, of those that we discussed, I, I think Cyto Atlas is a good resource mm -hmm. production to cytopathology. It has the different entities, most common entities that are encountered during a cytopathology uh, rotation. And it has both text information and images. It hasn't been updated for a while, but I think the principles haven't changed much in the past few years. So I would suggest that for as someone who is being initiated into cytopathology, that would be a great place to start. Sounds good. So, for instance, for people who are savvy or very much into teaching or something and they wanted to come up with an app themselves, they have an app idea, what is the, um, how shall I say, how to formulate an app or maybe the life cycle of an app? Uh, what does one do if they're interested in something like that? And I ask this because I know you have developed an app before. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, and I'm sure it wasn't that easy, but what are the ideas and how do you approach this? Well, um, as you mentioned, I do have some experience in this, and I, I think one of the main elements is you you want to have an interest in computer programming and developing software. And once you have that interest, um, it, it's pretty easy to uh, start the path on developing your own apps. Uh, there are various resources, books, uh, courses available for developing apps, uh, both for the iPhone and for Android phones. Uh, as I said, um, since there's tighter control on the App Store uh, for Apple, um, it's usually a more streamlined process to learn developing software for iPhones. But you can also do it for Android, especially if you have any computer programming experience. Um, and if you don't have any experience at all, but you have a great idea, uh, there are various resources where you can get in touch with software developers and you can contract with somebody. Uh, you just explain your idea. It's great to have storyboards or in other words, write down how you would like the screen to look at on a piece of paper. Uh, these are the different screens. This is how you would like the navigation buttons to work, how you would go from one screen to another, what selections you'd have to enter. So just developing that idea on a piece of paper and showing it to the developer and working with them through the development process, that's another way that you can uh, bring your app into reality if you don't have any computer programming experience or the time 
to do it on your own. And speaking of time, I think that's one important aspect to consider. For example, you mentioned the apps that I developed. I developed those apps, I think it was like six or seven years ago, uh, but I never had the time to maintain them. So as um, guidelines evolved and became updated, I, I didn't have the time to update my apps accordingly. So that's why I took them down from the app store. So um, if you want to get onto this route, uh, it's great, uh, but also it would be good if you could think of it in the long run that you want to maintain and support your app so that it can keep up with the times. Yeah, that's an important thing. So it's more than a solo person job, it's more of a team kind of approach. Exactly, That needs yeah. the nourishment along the way so that it's updated mm -hmm. and well kept and that sort of thing. That, that sounds good. Yes. Um, now in your other role, since you are, you know, um, the um, AP Cluster um, board, uh, board of Pathology Test Development Committee Chair, um, I don't know what the board feels about this. That's a whole separate issue. But is there any? Are there any apps that the residents could use? I mean, they're on their phones the entire time, um, and they're you know they're getting access to information this way. Wouldn't it be nice if there was a smartphone app that they could like review some of this material, you know, on their way into work on the bus or something like that? Does this exist? So. Um... We, we, we talked about uh, like reference books. Many of those references um, are available uh, not only as ebooks that you can view on your tablet or on your computer, but even you can look at them on the screen of your smartphone. Um, also, many of the journals um, have portal latest issues of the journals on your phone. Um, and listen to podcasts that are summarizing the results of those articles or maybe journal clubs, things like that. Um, and I think there are um, some test, sample test question apps where you could either um, share questions between your, yourself and your peers or there are already developed, but uh, I, I didn't review them much in terms of the quality of the questions that are available mm -hmm. there. Okay, well, that's good to know. Um, all right, I did have a couple of other things that came to mind. Um, so um, you said some of them, some of these apps are kind of under the FDA, especially if it's AI related, if it's FDA regulated. Mm -hmm. Some are under the enforcement. Who decides this? Is there an application process when somebody applies and then it goes through the FDA who says, I'm not interested, or yes, I am interested, or how does this go? Who decides? Um, so I'm not the expert on the regulatory aspects of it, but the document that I mentioned uh, that was issued by the FDA, they have a whole list of different examples of apps that could potentially fall in one of those three categories. Mm -hmm. So um, if the app that you're thinking of designing um, falls close to one of those examples, you can pretty much have your answer. If it falls into the first two categories, in other words, if it's uh, it's not considered a medical device, or if it could be considered a medical device, but the risks that are posed to patients and consumers is so minimal that the FDA has decided to uh, enforce, I mean, uh, exercise enforcement discretion, then you don't need to uh, submit it to the FDA for them to decide. But if, like, as you mentioned, the AI-based uh, applications, since there's a lot of, um, since it's going to be making a recommendation for the patient's treatment or diagnosis, uh, there is a higher level of risk, especially if the algorithms that are developed are faulty for any reason. And so those more sophisticated apps, it's better to submit them to the FDA, and then the FDA will tell you then, well, yes, this is something that should be uh, subject to our oversight or not. I see. So be on the cautious side if it's really related to direct patient care is what you're saying there. Yeah. So, okay. Yes, yes. Um, now, you did say there's all these different kinds of... Um, um, mountings on the uh, 
the microscope and you know I'm going to ask that. I mean, it happens in every other day. Maybe there's a new site in the hospital that gets added as an FNA location. And um, sometimes due to economic reasons, people are having difficulty getting the cameras for each location. But, you know, everybody runs around yes. with a cell phone. Mm -hmm. You can easily get a $50 or $100, whatever it may be, mounting. Um, you know, what should one look into when they are purchasing uh, some mounting um, device? Mm -hmm. What would be helpful mm -hmm. if you haven't bought anything before and if you're just listening to this mm -hmm. conversation now and they're saying, yeah, you know, maybe I need it, but what should I look for? Mm -hmm. What would be your answer for that? So um, there are two types of these smartphone adapters that I've seen. Um, one is the type that only attaches to one of the ocular lenses, and there's another type that attaches to both. And the ones that attach to both, I found them to be more stable and um, easier to install. And especially if you're going to put it like on an FNA cart uh, where you're moving it around, you want to have something that's stable. So uh, one factor to look into is, does it mount on one ocular lens or both ocular lenses? The other is that you're probably, you might have a cell phone that you're using in the workplace right now, uh, but you never know what you're going to be doing in the future, what other brand or model you might be using. So mm -hmm. it's best to look into a smartphone adapter that is adjustable designed hmm. for a specific brand or model. So in case you decide to switch out the smartphone that you're using for this purpose, you can easily use the same mount uh, for that. Hmm. That's good. Yeah, you're right. I mean, if you switch from an iPhone to an Android or something like that, would it still hold it in place, that sort of thing? I right, see. right, yeah. yeah. And typically, what are the prices of these? Equipment. So um, when uh, I did this review a few years ago for the ASC, the price ranges was about like 60 to close to $100. But uh, in my recent search, the prices had dropped significantly. So you can find, I, I think, a decent one under $50. Really? Okay. Yeah. That's good to know. Okay. Well... Very nice. Um, thank you. Um, is there anything else, parting thoughts from your side? Any other thoughts? No. What, what you mentioned about um, what do you do if you have an idea, I, I think that's a great um, segue and suggestion. So I would invite um, anyone who's listening and watching this webinar, uh, if you have a great idea for developing an app, um, and if you want to develop it yourself, or if you want to contact uh, a contractor, uh, but maybe you could contact the um, Product Innovation Committee of the ASC, and we could maybe consider and see if it's something that the ASC could sponsor. That sounds good. Another plug-in for the ASC. Perfect. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, and and uh, for that, you could always, you know, email uh, whoever's listening. You can email Cytopathology, um, our website. Uh, so that would be, um, Beth, if you're listening, that's Cytopathology at Cytopathology.org, I think is our email. Um, but if that is incorrect, Beth can correct me there. It's ASC at Cytopathology.org. ASC at Cytopathology.org. Okay, that sounds good. Now we have a contact information there, too. All right. Well, um, thank you very much, Dr. Gofrani, for uh, bringing us up to speed um, on the smartphones and all the technical aspects. It was, um, as always, very nice listening to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you.